For most of my life, I have been an artist. And when I am in need of inspiration, I find myself drawn to this old portfolio of sketches I made when I was a young man in Paris and had the good fortune to witness the birth of a monument so spectacular they called it the eighth wonder of the world. It inspires me still to think of it. The great men who dared to defy the laws of nature itself and how they built the Statue of Liberty. My story begins in Paris in 1875. I had recently come from my home in Alsace to study architectural drawing, when whom should I meet quite by chance but my old friend, the sculptor Bartholdi. Good to see you. We had been neighbors in Alsace, and I had not seen him in some time. I found him in a great state of excitement. I am to build an exceptional monument. It will be the largest statue in the entire world, and it will represent Liberty. He went on to reveal that the monument was the idea of his friend de Laboulay, the eminent professor of law. Were not France and Americans historic partners in liberty? What better way to strengthen that bond than to create a monumental birthday gift for the 100th birthday of America? Go to see that country, he said to me. You will go and study it and bring back your impressions. And propose to our friends over there to build with us a monument a common work in remembrance of the ancient friendship between France and the United States. The definite plan was first clear to my eyes at the view of the harbor of New York. It is thrilling. Yes, in this very place shall be raised the Statue of Liberty, grand as the idea it embodies. Grand ideas were Bartholdi's passion. He had traveled much among the monuments of Egypt, experimenting with the new science of photography. He had even designed a colossal statue for the entrance of the new Suez Canal, but alas, Egypt could not come up with the funds to build it. But this project, he assured me, would be different. It would be executed in common by the two peoples, associated as they were in the founding of independence. We will make a gift of the statue, and the Americans will execute and meet expenses for the pedestal. To raise money from the French people, Bartholdi and his friend de la Bollet formed the French-American Union. Even school children were encouraged to contribute. My own contribution would be to make sketches of the work as it progressed, to document the project for posterity. For the next three years, Bartholdi was a man obsessed, designing and redesigning, talking of nothing but his statue. Colossal statuary does not consist simply in building an enormous statue. It should produce an emotion in the breast of the spectator, not because of its volume, but because its size is in keeping with the idea that it interprets. There was much discussion about what the statue would look like. A woman in robes holding a light was a classical symbol of liberty that had graced many works of art. Bartholdi would add many modern features. On her head, a crown of seven rays for the seven seas and seven continents. In her left hand, a tablet representing the law. In her right hand, a torch, a symbol of enlightenment, but a symbol only, not meant to be illuminated. The real light would come from her noble brow. Liberty's function was to be a lighthouse. A luminous halo extending from her forehead will shine afar upon the immense sea. And her name shall be Liberty Enlightening the World. But, of course, to me, she will always be my American. <laughs> now, shall she be cast in bronze or carved in stone? Neither. Too heavy, too costly. My American must be light. She must be easy to transport. She will be made out of copper thin, light sheets of beaten copper. It allows subdivisions in the pieces and makes transportation easy. Liberty was coming to life before my very eyes. 
I was making some sketches of Bartholdi as he was completing his final model when I observed something familiar about the statue's face, this stern, austere expression. Forgive me for asking, but is not the face the very image of your own mother? Of course. I could not think of a more appropriate mother. Ah, but what about the gorgeous figure? Your wife, perhaps? Ah, my friend, discretion forbids. That is a matter between me and the lady. <laughs> At this point, Bartholdi the artist stepped back and Bartholdi the engineer came forward. Making small changes, he built a second model about nine and a half feet tall, one sixteenth of the height the actual statue would be. His third working model was 38 feet tall. This model was a quarter the size of the final statue. The statue itself would be so big, it would have to be built in sections. A special measuring frame was built for each model section, and another frame was built beside it four times as big. Using rulers, plumb lines, and compasses, they made measurements from the model section and began building a wooden copy four times larger from the bottom up. It was finished in plaster and filed and smoothed by hand. The completed head and shoulders measured 30 feet high, creating quite a sensation when it was sent to the Paris Exposition in 1878. The arm and torch, which had been completed first, had been sent to the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia to give America an idea of the work. But some Americans were not happy to get only an arm for their birthday when they'd been promised a whole statue. Meanwhile, back in Paris, all was frantic activity as Bartholdi's workmen built Liberty's body section by section. <laughs> Bartholdi was everywhere, supervising every aspect of the work, and I hurried after him with my sketchbook, dodging wood and lumps of wet plaster. The plaster caught my attention in more ways than one. The final statue was to be shaped of beaten copper, but one could not hammer copper against plaster. The plaster would break. Bartholdi solved this problem with a revolutionary technique. He had his workmen build wooden molds over the plaster, bending and cutting the wood to conform exactly with the plaster's contours. When the mold was completed, it was an exact replica of a section's plaster surface, in reverse. The workmen now had a hard surface against which to hammer and shape their thin copper sheets. They beveled and filed the edges so they would fit together perfectly and no rain could seep in. The edges were held together by rivets. The final step was to give Liberty her ribs. Iron bars were attached to each copper plate to keep the soft copper from losing its shape. The work was progressing so rapidly I could barely take it all in. Wooden molds were being built, copper hammered, old plaster destroyed. There would be 300 copper sections in all. But what was going to hold it up? The largest statue that ever stood would need an engineering miracle just to get on her feet. Holding the Statue of Liberty together, keeping her stable on her pedestal, would strain the imagination of any engineer. Even in our advanced times. One early plan called for the statue to be filled up to her hips with sand. However, this would not prevent the weight of the top part of the statue from crushing the bottom. Bartholdi presented the problem to a fellow engineer named Gustav Eiffel, who came up with a completely new idea. I will build a tower of wrought iron for this statue to hang upon. Will it hold up 100 tons of copper? It will hold. Will it, will it hold against the winds and the tides? It will hold. Incroyable. It was truly a revolutionary design a 96-foot-high iron tower with supporting light beams. The tower would hold up the weight, not the bottom of the statue. 
the iron bars that would attach to the copper pieces were in turn attached to other bars that would act like springs, allowing this statue to bend and flex in high winds or extremes of temperature. It met all of Bartholdi's specifications. And since all elements of its construction are everywhere visible, it will be easy to maintain. Ah, monsieur, my congratulations. Liberty owes you her skeleton. Congratulations. Merci. <laughs> Merci. Congratulations. Monsieur Eiffel was to make quite a name for himself with his towers. But his most famous tower was still in the future, in the autumn of 1881, when his skeleton for Liberty started to go up. Copper Smith brought out finished sections, hauled them up the skeleton, and hauled them back down for reworking if the fit was not perfect. The torch had come back from Philadelphia. The head had been sitting around since the Paris Exposition had closed three years before. By the spring of 1884, Liberty was standing in Paris. On July 4th, it was officially presented to the American ambassador who entered the statue through her foot. Bartholdi had hoped to unveil his statue in New York on that day, but work on the pedestal had barely begun. The statue was ready for America, but America was not ready for the statue. From the beginning, the Statue of Liberty was envisioned as a joint project of two peoples. The people of France would build and pay for the statue. The people of America would build and pay for the pedestal. In 1883, the Americans put up a huge foundation on Bedloe's Island, a 65-foot high pyramid made of 23,000 tons of concrete. On top of this would be built the 89-foot pedestal designed by the society architect Richard Morris Hunt. Hunt's design had many Egyptian and classical features. It also had intricate stonework, which greatly increased its cost. Work on the pedestal started in the summer of 1884 and stopped two months later. The small amount of money the Americans had raised had run out. Meanwhile, back in Paris, Bartholdi grew tired of waiting. He had his workmen take down the statue and pack her into 210 crates to be shipped to New York. As I had always had a great curiosity to visit America, I packed up my sketch pad and accompanied the statue on the voyage. And what a voyage! We were not long away when we were struck by a tremendous storm. The huge load of copper pieces shifted alarmingly, and I prayed to heaven to spare liberty and me from a watery grave. The storm abated, and we arrived intact on a sparkling June morning to be greeted by a splendid naval parade. But our hearts sank as we sail by the still unfinished pedestal. Our hopes of seeing the statue in place by July 4th of 1885 were dashed. Nonetheless, we set to work unpacking some of the statue and attaching the ribs to the copper plates to keep them from losing their shape. There were many visitors that summer who posed for my sketches among the giant toes and fingers. Winter came and went. Bartholdi began to despair. Perhaps I should offer my American to Philadelphia instead. No, your heart is set on New York. Perhaps I should recast the statue and show her twiddling her <laughs> thumbs. This delay is a disgrace. Well, Bartholdi was not the only one to call the situation a disgrace. His feelings were shared by Joseph Pulitzer, the publisher of the New York World. First, Pulitzer called on New York's millionaires, then, he appealed to the common people. Ah, at last. Pulitzer published the name of every contributor in his newspaper, even though most gave less than a dollar. Collection boxes were everywhere, even on the Brooklyn Bridge, and Pulitzer raised $120,000. Work on the pedestal could now resume, and I could go back to my sketching. 
By May 1886, the pedestal was ready. Two months later, Eiffel's tower stood above New York Harbor, anchored 55 feet down into the foundation. To overturn it, one would need to overturn the whole island. A steam-powered derrick at the top of the tower was used to hoist up the copper pieces. Some of the pieces had been incorrectly labeled when they had been packed in Paris, and often as many as 20 pieces had to be tried to find the right one. It was dangerous work that summer. Lightning struck the tower several times, but was grounded by four copper rods driven straight through the foundation. For the installation of the torch, riveters were dangling 300 feet in the air. But I was determined to document the whole process, whatever the risks. The last piece of copper, the bottom of Liberty's right foot, was riveted into place on October 25, 1886. But there were still a few questions, especially about her future as a lighthouse. No arrangements had been made by the American government, and both power and light had to be furnished at the last minute. Bartholdi paced and worried and prayed. May God be pleased to bless my efforts and my work, and to crown it with the success, duration, and moral influence it ought to have. He had not long to wait. The official presentation ceremony was just three days away. October 28, 1886. It was raining in New York, but nothing could dampen the excitement. My sketchbook fairly trembled in my hands. An official holiday, Bartholdi Day, had been declared, and huge crowds filled the streets. Thousands of people paraded down Broadway. Even the president was there. Bartholdi himself was up in the torch, ready to release the flag after the president's speech. But Bartholdi was so nervous, he dropped the flag before the president even started speaking. And all the people, boats and church bells rang out in celebration. It was the proudest, happiest day of my life that day so many years ago. Liberty and I are still here. Both of us have felt the passing of the years. My hair has turned white. Liberty's copper skin has turned a soft green. She never succeeded as a lighthouse. Even Bartholdi had to admit she looked like a glowworm. And further attempts to improve the situation were given up in 1902. But. She became a beacon of far greater significance to millions of immigrants. The poem placed at her feet in 1903 calls her Mother of Exiles. She has shown the light of liberty to people all over the world. And that, I think, would have pleased Bartholdi had he lived to see it. Bartholdi died of tuberculosis in France in 1904, but his spirit, like his statue, lives on. My sketches are beginning to fade and crumble, and soon they, like I, will be no more. But what these sketches represent will last until eternity, a monument not only to freedom, but to great men of genius, courage, and skill, who caused two great nations to come together in industry and peace and how they built the Statue of Liberty. <laughs>